When I was a kid, there was certainly no shortage of sitcoms to choose from, and a lot of them were effective at grabbing my attention and loyalty. Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide on Nickelodeon, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody over on Disney Channel. These shows were really important to me, but the problem is, I stopped watching or caring about them after they ended. Except for one. Enter Drake and Josh. Now that I've entered adulthood, I can confidently say that Drake and Josh was my favorite sitcom growing up. This show was on during the mid-2000s, a time period I remember like it was yesterday. Riding the bus home from school, listening to the All-American Rejects on my iPod Nano, grabbing some rainbow goldfish and putting them in an animal-shaped paper plate, taking a seat next to a fat CRT TV, and getting a load of this. Just park the car oh, would you let go of my no, wheel? Park the hey, come on! Hey, watch it, watch it! <laughs> In all seriousness, I want to talk about why I enjoy Drake and Josh so much, because it was absolutely instrumental in forming my sense of humor and, in my opinion, raised the bar for children's sitcoms. I'll also preface my thoughts by saying that this video is less of a review and more of a personal nostalgia bias summary of my admiration for this show. Without further ado, let's get this show on the road. There's really a lot to love about Drake and Josh, and it's full of things that make it stand out from the rest. Nickelodeon sitcoms have notoriously had fairly conventional premises. Girls finding success by using modern technology, a fish-out-of-water story involving an ordinary girl at a glorious boarding school, and possibly the most conventional, two polar opposite stepbrothers having to get along. Yet it was that premise that was easily the most memorable and entertaining for me. I wasn't a fully grown teenager, I didn't have any step-siblings or much of a rivalry with my brother, but there was an element of relatability this show had that's hard to explain. In one way or another, I looked up to both Drake and Josh as role models despite their twisted antics. Drake had a striking amount of charisma, and Josh had a super determined work ethic with good intentions. I should also mention that their room was the coolest thing ever. Obviously, I realized that this was a set built on a soundstage, but I grew up in a relatively small household, so I always dreamt of having a lofted bed and sofa surrounded by loads of knickknacks and open space. It just seemed like a really cool area to hang out in. I know I'm putting this show on a very high pedestal, but it had a wide range of weirdness and physical comedy you couldn't find anywhere else. I heavily criticized the last show I reviewed for having tons of random humor, and yes, Drake and Josh has its share of that, but the random humor here usually works within the context of the scene or the dynamics between the characters. Unlike Planet Sheen, there's some form of setup for most of these jokes, aside from non sequiturs, and the characters in Drake and Josh are, for the most part, genuinely funny, as opposed to awfully annoying. For example, you have people like Crazy Steve, who acts bizarre as all get out, but there's always other characters on screen to neutralize that situation. Don't, Just don't stay back! It. Stay back! Hey, 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 what makes Drake and Josh feel so universally appealing is the fact that it's more of a family show than a kid's show. It aired on a kid's network and featured a lot of kids, but it had enough substance to let almost anybody take something away from it. It didn't entirely focus on that 6-11 to 11 year old children's demographic like many of its contemporaries did. The Parker Nichols family was full of differing personalities, albeit full of cliches and tropes, and the show primarily featured adults or older teens as the secondary cast, which isn't typical for a kid's sitcom. Also, Drake and Josh played high schoolers, but in real life they were legally adults for most of the show's run. In my opinion, their maturity and past experience acting made them capable of giving much more compelling performances than what most other child actors could probably do. And although the cast was mostly men, I don't necessarily think it was a show for one gender or the other. It was well made and anyone could enjoy it. Boys wanted to be Drake and girls wanted to be with Drake. Another aspect of Drake and Josh that made it much more accessible to other age groups was the comedy. I wouldn't go as far as to say it had genius comedy writing, but man, this show is funny. The humor was always kid-friendly, but the show included some jokes that were more adult-oriented too. These jokes were usually non-sequiturs that were fairly harmless and flew right over the heads of kids like me. Hey, Josh! What? I think Megan has a fix for your little problem. I've been eating bran every day. <laughs> Not that 
problem. In addition to characters saying insulting one-liners and Josh restating things in different voices, Drinking Josh surprisingly features a lot of physical, borderline slapstick comedy. There's plenty of exaggerated gestures and expressions alongside elaborate stunts and manic activity. Physical comedy is probably the most all-inclusive type of comedy there is because you can be any age and still think that people falling over is funny. It's generally inoffensive and doesn't require you to be in on the joke to make you laugh. Of course comedy is subjective, and not everyone finds physical comedy funny. However, I think it undoubtedly requires a lot of talent to perform, and I really appreciate that. In the words of Martin Short, comedy is so subjective. If you trip and fall down, some people will laugh, and some people will say, oh, physical comedy is so pedestrian. Some people look at Three Stooges as lowbrow. Some people consider them artists. No one is wrong, it's just a personal take. And this probably goes without saying, but Drake and Josh is most definitely a product of its time. Besides the fact that the show screams mid-2000s Southern California culture, there's a lot of stuff the show got away with that probably wouldn't make it past standards and practices today. Some of these things they included would almost certainly be labeled as controversial now, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. In the episode Paging Dr. Drake Alone, there's several jokes about death, Drake impersonates a doctor for most of the episode and almost performs a surgery, Josh also impersonates a doctor and uses an Indian accent, and Drake jumps out of a window to evade getting arrested. This is besides the point, but it also snows inside their room at the end of the episode. How does that happen? But yeah, the amped up humor and amount of infighting within the family gave the show a different atmosphere than other shows that favored those good old fashioned values on which we used to rely. Joking aside, I think a good measure of how popular this show is, or any show for that matter, is its quotability. It's amazing how I can say things like, whoa, just take it easy, man, or spherical in casual conversation and most people within my age range can understand the reference. Like many other well-known sitcoms, there's an endless amount of iconic catchphrases and peculiar jokes that can apply to a lot of real-life scenarios. This also applies to random humor, but it's hard to not find this stuff funny out of context. Despite the connections it shares with real life, there's absolutely insane things that happen in the world of Drake and Josh, but because of how frequent those things are and the general nature of the show itself, this stuff never feels out of place. Like, remember when they purchased an orangutan from a car dealership and mistakenly sold it to a doctor obsessed with eating primates? Or the special where they were threatened with a $5 million lawsuit after switching out the music on a Super Bowl commercial? Even better, how about the time they crashed a helicopter into the ocean and ended up with a $400,000 bill after causing the pilot to lose consciousness? These are just the generally accepted things that happen in the daily lives of this family. The collective amount of property damage, trespassing, and overall illegal activities the boys racked up throughout the series must have been ridiculous. So, some of the things that happen in this show are extraordinarily whack, but nonetheless, it still follows a few general story ideas that they like to use often. The two most common being Drake and Josh getting stuck or stranded in a situation, and the boys taking on a new opportunity that later backfires. Somehow, they usually manage to incorporate entertaining twists or odd interactions within these episodes that make them worth watching despite their familiar story beats. The episodes where they get stuck or stranded especially rely on the back and forth between the two, along with whatever unexpected obstacles they face, which tends to provide my standard for comedy gold. One more thing I want to point out before moving on to the next section of the video is, how do you explain the introductions of each episode? You know, the part where Drake and Josh tell opposing stories and it's usually an anecdote for the rest of the episode? Is it a video diary? Is there a canon explanation for why they exist? I honestly have no idea. Who is this guy? Who? You! I'm Dave. What are you doing here? I don't know. I just bought a new webcam, hooked it up, and turned it on. Let's move on to what I think is the most impressive feat of this show, and what I'd like to be the biggest takeaway from this video. The progression of Drake and Josh. Even though Drake and Josh only lasted about three and a half years, there was a surprising amount of change across each season, and in my opinion, change for the better. I like to think that in many ways, the show aged like a fine wine. But I'll start this out by saying what some might consider a hot take. I don't like the first season of Drake and Josh. There's only six episodes in the first season, but the characters are extremely two-dimensional, the jokes come off as extremely forced, and everything that happens feels much more calculated. There's an element of spontaneity in the later seasons where it feels like unexpected things could happen all the time, but the early episodes represent much more of a by-the-books children's sitcom. It focuses pretty heavily on their high school experiences and the relationship drama that comes along with it, which gets old pretty quick if you've seen any other show about teens. Coming off of being sketch comedy actors from The Amanda Show, Drake Bell and Josh Pegg already had experience working together, but they lacked any sort of chemistry early on. Giving them the benefit of the doubt, though, this might have been intentional. 
At this point in the series, they're polar opposites. Drake is an attractive stud that performs popular music, while Josh is an unlikable dork. It wouldn't make much sense for them to work well together when their characters are forced to coexist while being completely different people. And in fairness, it's understandable that the first season was rough because that tends to be the case for a lot of other shows. It's not exactly common to find a show that has its golden age in the first season because they're still trying to figure things out and decide what direction they want to take. For me, the only memorable episode from season 1 was Dune Buggy. I remember Dune Buggy airing a lot, which probably contributes to why I'm more familiar with it, but watching back through the episode, it feels way more like its own thing as opposed to the other generic plots from the season. Drake attempting to cover up crashing a Dune Buggy seems like something almost exclusive to the show. Whereas in another season 1 episode, like Two Idiots and a Baby, there's so many other sitcoms that could have a plot about the protagonist irresponsibly trying to babysit a child. Thankfully the show aged the way it did because the later seasons contain what I'd consider to be the best episodes of the series. A good portion of classic episodes like Josh Runs Into Oprah, I Love Sushi, The Storm, and Treehouse are all from the last season alone. By the end, Drake and Josh have a fulfilling dynamic that's really satisfying to see. In one way or another, this show had interesting character arcs with great conclusions. Drake and Josh start out as foil characters with a distaste for each other, but eventually they begin relying on each other, cooperating, and forming a strong brotherly bond. The season 4 episode Josh is done especially puts their relationship to the test. After Drake forgets to bring Josh to school in favor of meeting up with a girl, Josh practically severs all of the ties he shares with them. They're still roommates, but that's it. Josh starts finding success in all areas of his life while Drake's well-being diminishes. Through an absurd amount of unrealistic suffering, Drake realizes that he needs Josh and regrets not appreciating him more. It's almost a binary to the beginning of the series, where Josh constantly needs advice from Drake to seem cool and get the attention of girls. In Season 4, Drake loses some of his ego and becomes much more accepting of Josh's quirks, even offering to go on double dates. Speaking of whom, the character who clearly underwent the most amount of change in this show is Josh. I definitely couldn't have made this video without mentioning the incredible weight loss Josh had throughout the series' run. For some reason, people seem to have this notion that when actors lose weight, they're not funny anymore, but I'd argue that Josh became way more funny after he lost the weight. Losing the weight allowed him to build more confidence and embrace himself. Not only does he demonstrate more physical comedy, but he also develops a bit of a snarky edge that makes his dynamic with Drake more balanced. His super hammed up expressions and reactions are probably the thing I find the most funny on this entire show. You don't always see an actor's real life changes tie into their fictional character's development, and it always struck me as odd but appropriate that they didn't directly reference it. With more confidence and a refined appearance, he naturally became more competitive with Drake in a multitude of ways, namely seeing who could pick up the most amount of girls. Josh toned down the dorkiness as well, but still retained some of those qualities later on. Drake was definitely still the most cunning of the two, but Josh's transformation leveled the playing field for sure. Let's switch gears and talk about the most divisive element of this show. Megan. Megan. <laughs> the evil sibling archetype has existed for ages, but Drake and Josh really takes things to the extreme with their little sister. Many fans of the show despised Megan for essentially torturing Drake and Josh with her always coming out on top. The show does a lot to reveal how devious Megan really is, with elaborate pranks and a strong connection to advanced technology. Her early pranks weren't typically as sophisticated as they were later on, but when she was younger she comes off as more evil and mean-spirited. She seemed to live off of making them suffer, and kisses up to their parents as a sweet and innocent child. But later on, her antics are less sadistic, and more for the purpose of just messing with them. Not to mention, there's a few instances where she's totally justified in pranking Drake and Josh, or as she would call them, boobs. I don't know how popular this opinion is either, but I thought a lot of their miserable reactions to Megan's mischief were genuinely funny. A great episode that explores Drake and Josh's dynamic with Megan is Megan's Revenge, in which they're insanely paranoid about how Megan's gonna strike back at them after thinking they killed her hamster. Hey guys. <laughs> what are you doing here? What's wrong with you two? Why do you look like you haven't slept in two days? <laughs> you, you don't need to know things. Yeah, just leave us alone. <laughs> As for the parents, they remain fairly consistent throughout the show, and their mom doesn't really change at all with whatever little traits she had to begin with. Their dad Walter got a little more fleshed out, though he remained incredibly silly and inferior to his competitor Bruce Winchill. I am glad though that we got Jonathan Goldstein to play the father, because it'd be really hard for me to imagine seeing someone else in that role, and a different actor who I'm not as fond of actually portrayed the dad in the original pilot. Really good. He really is. I taught him everything he knows. Here, I'll show you. Toss me the rock. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come in. With the main cast of the show covered, another development the show had was establishing a cast of secondary characters. The second season episode, Movie Job, introduces the premiere, a location that would be frequently used for the rest of the show. 
There's several important scenes throughout Drake and Josh that take place in the lobby of this movie theater. Since Josh keeps the job, we get a bunch of interesting recurring characters, like the manager Helen, the notorious crazy Steve, and the somewhat perverted Gavin. Season 2 also introduced us to Mindy, Josh's on and off love interest throughout the series, and the resident nerds of the show, Craig and Eric. I'm really glad the show branched out and added more characters because I don't think it would have been nearly as successful if it stayed stagnant as a dumbed-down high school sitcom. These side characters easily provided some of the most memorable moments in the entire series. As outlandish as this show can be, the larger cast made it feel more authentic and gave Drake and Josh more people to play off of. In addition to expanding its cast, Drake and Josh also became a more adventurous show in its latter half. While the first two seasons of the show mainly take place at either their house, the premiere, or Bellevue High School, seasons three and four use a variety of different locations, which adds a lot to the scale and production value of the show. Many of the later episodes incorporate brand new sets, and season four especially includes a decent amount of on-location outdoor shooting, which was refreshing to see after years of noticeably artificial indoor sets. Another relatively adventurous journey this show took on was in the form of a made-for-TV movie, Drake and Josh Go Hollywood. After Megan boards the wrong flight to Los Angeles instead of Denver, Drake and Josh follow her there, but get caught up in an elaborate crime scheme after Josh accidentally swaps MP3 players with a criminal. Also, Josh becomes Drake's music manager and gets him a gig on MTV. So yeah, there's a lot going on there, but it's decent for a TV movie. The production value is higher than what you'd see on the show, with a good portion of it shot on a single camera setup. Although the hostage and crime lord aspects of it felt unnecessarily dramatic, the music in the movie was great, and the story helped develop the relationship between Drake and Josh even further. There was another TV movie that aired about a year after the show ended called Merry Christmas, Drake and Josh. In this movie, Drake and Josh meet a lonely orphan and promise to give her foster family the best Christmas ever. Also, they get arrested and tormented by their parole officer. And for some reason, their parents decide to go on vacation again. I'll be honest here, as a kid, I was glad that we got to see more of Drake and Josh after the show ended, but I've never been a fan of this movie. I know I just praised the later seasons of this show for being adventurous, but this movie takes it way too far. Drake and Josh still felt like Drake and Josh later on, but this movie has a completely different identity, and it feels like it could be anyone's typical Christmas movie. There's way too much I have to say about Merry Christmas, Drake and Josh, so I'll probably make a video solely dedicated to it sometime. One more thing I remembered while editing this, Helen actually brings up Josh's weight loss in the movie because he's apparently too skinny to be Santa. So yeah, that's another reason why I pretend this doesn't exist. But back on the topic of progression, how has the TV show itself aged now that it's been off the air for well over 10 years? In my opinion, very well. I acknowledge that I'm clouded by fond memories of watching this show in my childhood, but I've rewatched a vast majority of it in the past few months and I've still enjoyed it more than I do most other shows. It certainly references things from the mid-2000s, like flip phones and rock music, R.I.P., but at its core, the misadventures of Drake and Josh are timeless. At any point in time, most people will be able to relate to arguing with siblings, gaining confidence and overcoming social anxiety, working a strange job, or coming together with people despite your differences. It's been quite a while since this show was in production, so where are Drake and Josh now? Drake Bell went on to star as Timmy Turner in some not-so-great live-action Fairly Odd Parents TV movies and provided the voice for Spider-Man in a variety of different animated shows and video games. Drake also had some real-life troubles with the law, but it seems like he's cleaned up and moved past his mistakes. He still makes music, lives the rock star lifestyle, and tours frequently. Josh Peck also got some gigs after the show ended. He was the voice of Eddie in the Ice Age franchise, starred in the not-so-good Red Dawn remake, voiced Casey Jones in the CG TMNT series, and also co-starred in a short-lived Fox sitcom with John Stamos called Grandfathered. For the most part, though, I'd currently consider Josh Peck to be less of an actor and more of a social media influencer. Josh was one of the first popular creators on Vine, also R.I.P., and now he regularly appears in David Dobrik's extremely popular vlogs. They certainly haven't shied away from referencing Drake and Josh. Hey Josh, come on, we gotta go to the movies, we'll be late. Okay, let's go to the premiere. If I'm late again, I'm gonna get fired. Fired? <laughs> Drake and Josh themselves have been in occasional contact with each other since the show ended and still reflect positively upon their experiences. It seems though that Josh has moved on and has been doing other things while Drake is still constantly questioned about his time at Nickelodeon. There was a lot of controversy and drama in 2017 when it was revealed that Drake wasn't invited to Josh's wedding, but it looks like they've rekindled their friendship and still hang out together once in a while. Drake and Josh still airs in the form of reruns on Teen Nick every so often, and most of the show is available on Hulu. It's probably not going to get passed down to the next generation of kids, which is depressing, but it remains a gem of the past that will forever serve as one of the most pivotal pieces of entertainment to me. But wait. 
One last note is that just a few months ago in March, Drake and Josh were seen with their attorneys outside of the Viacom building. Does this mean that a Drake and Josh reboot is in the works? Sadly, no. They've confirmed that they'd be playing different characters, and this project is supposedly more creative with a bit of an adult edge. If whatever they're working on comes to fruition, I'll be the first to watch it and support it because they have amazing chemistry together. In some ways, I'm actually kind of glad it's not a reboot, because if this doesn't turn out well, it won't be able to tarnish the legacy of their original show. But I'm gonna close the book here because that's all I have to say about Drake and Josh for now. Thanks to those of you who stuck through the entire video and listened to me ramble on about my childhood. This is my first video in about four months, so I'd really appreciate it if you showed some support by liking the video, and if you're new, please consider subscribing because I'll be working on tons of new content to give you guys over the summer. I know it's late, but I also wanted to thank you all for helping me reach 10,000 subscribers. I definitely didn't expect my Planet Sheen video to blow up like it did, so it brought a lot of attention and new faces to my channel. Hitting this milestone means a lot to me because I've been doing YouTube for a very long time, and it's an accomplishment to show for all of the time and effort I've put into making these videos. I'm still trying to come up with a good way to celebrate this, so if you have any good ideas, let me know down in the comments. Feel free to give me your feedback on this video as well, and any thoughts or memories about Drake and Josh. I'd also like to point out that I've relaunched my Patreon page, so if you'd like to support the channel, donate, and get some sweet perks for doing so, you can find it in the description or on the end screen. As always, thank you all for watching, and have a spectacular day.